introducing our panel moderator, Charles Dew. And um, it's quite an enjoyable thing because I've known him for quite some time. In fact, uh, the library republished his classic work on the Treadier Ironworks back in 1999. It's hard to remember we're that old, Charles. It is. Yeah. It is. But I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, he teaches uh, history of the South and the Civil War and Reconstruction at Williams College, uh, where he is the Ephraim Williams Professor of American History. As I mentioned, he published Iron Maker to the Confederacy, Joseph R. Anderson and the Treadier Ironworks. Uh, another book, a wonderful book, on also on slavery and iron making, Bond of Iron, Master and Slave at Buffalo Forge, 1994. And in 2001, he published Apostles of Disunion, Southern Secessionist Commissioners and the Causes of the Civil War. Um, he is really in a somewhat unique place to be moderating our conversation, I think. He is currently has a book in manuscript called The Making and Unmaking of a Racist, Reflections on a History, the South, and the Slave Trade. And it's part, um, and I'll let him describe it perhaps a little bit more in detail if he'd like, but part memoir of someone who's written extensively about the history of slavery, and also his reflections particularly on some a, a particular document of the slave trade that he's used extensively in his teaching. Um, he has the, I don't know whether one, one might call it the distinction of being directly related to uh, Thomas Roderick Dew, who was the president of the College of William and Mary, but also wrote one of the most uh, important pro-slavery tracts ever published in the antebellum South. So that's a history that I'm sure weighs somewhat on him and how he thinks about what he does in uh, today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Charles Dew and he will introduce the rest of our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I've, I've got a lot to live down. Uh, <laughs> Thomas Roderick Dew is an ancestor that uh, I don't think too many of us would, uh, would brag about. Uh, maybe we can talk about him at some point. Um, I feel very privileged to be up here today to introduce our, our panelists. This is a, an extremely distinguished uh, group, and I want to start by mentioning the uh, young lady right to my left, uh, Alexandra Finley. She is a doctoral candidate at the College of William and Mary right now, but she is doing fascinating work on Richmond slave traders who were married to African American women or who wanted to be married to African American women, but were forbidden by law to be uh, so married. Uh, men like Silas. Uh, Omohundro and Hector Davis. These are names that have come up earlier. I think we're all waiting for that dissertation. Um, Maureen McGinnis was introduced earlier. I won't say any more about her, uh, except to say that her book on uh, slavery, both in that you saw today and her work on the slave trade in Richmond is extraordinary. I don't know of any historian who has done the work that she has done on the Richmond slave trade, and she was trained as an art historian, which makes all of us just a little humble, uh, Maury, to, to, to put it mildly. Uh, that, that's just an extraordinary piece of work. Um, Calvin Schirmerhorn is doing fascinating work uh, on the institution of slavery. He began with a, a superb book, uh, Money Over Mastery, Family Over Freedom, Slavery in the Antebellum Upper South, which was published in 2011. Uh, he is a member of the School of Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. I love that phrase, the <laughs> Historical, Philosophical, and Religious Studies. That has a wonderful uh, ring to it. Uh, at Arizona State University, a land of warmth. Um, which all of us can use more of. He has just um, received, I think, and I have ordered, but it hasn't yet come, a book from Yale University Press that we're all very anxious to see. It's called The Business of Slavery and the Rise of American Capitalism, 1815-1860. Uh, this is going to tell us a great deal about what's been happening uh, very recently in American historical scholarship, linking up the rise of American capitalism with the slave system, uh, the slave trade, 
uh, the production of slaves uh, as, a, as a commodity that, that fueled American trade, and the, the way in which slaves served as a, a basis for credit uh, that helped the United States economy grow uh, prior to the Civil War. Um, Philip Troutman, uh, on that uh, end of the, of the panel, teaches writing at the George Washington University. His training is in history, though. His dissertation, Sentiment in the Slave Market, was done at the uh, University of Virginia. He has two superb essays on, on slavery, one in uh, a book called New Studies in the History of American Slavery, uh, and another in a book called The Chattel Principle that are, are wonderful pieces. Uh, his current research is looking at how radical abolitionists deploy, uh, deployed visual images of African Americans as active and sometimes violent agents of liberation. And he is working on the anti-slavery act activists in New York City uh, who frequently interviewed fugitives when they were caught and jailed in New York and then used that information in their abolitionist activities. So we have a wide range of, of interests and um, perspectives here on, on slavery. Uh, the Richmond slave trade in particular, and um, I thought we'd just start with a sort of general question, and um, Calvin said he would be, be glad to lead. Um, just exactly what was the slave trade, and why was it so important? Um, that's probably as good a place to begin as any. Calvin, you can get us, get us going. What was the slave trade? Well, the slave trade was many things. And one thing that it was, was a financial network, a business network. Slave traders tended to be business insiders. Uh, there's an old myth that slave traders were social outcasts and were not fit for respectable society. That uh, our research uncovers that just wasn't true. Uh, it brings to mind a, a quote from uh, Isaac Franklin, the managing partner of the largest slave trading firm of the 1830s writing his partner in Richmond in 1834, saying, I have always held credit above price. And this is an indication that, like modern business credit, uh, financial uh, institutions and the financial integration of the, the North Atlantic of Britain and the United States was largely responsible for the dynamism in the slave trade. So what did that mean for Richmond? It meant that all that cash, all those banknotes that were traded for human beings had to originate somewhere. And it wasn't just in the vaults of the Farmers Bank or the Bank of Virginia, but the, uh, the, the credit networks that slave traders um, formed meant that as they assembled individuals into caravans or coffles, marched them to the, the dock or to the railroad depot and shipped them off to New Orleans, a river of borrowed wealth was coming back in return in the form of bills of exchange and other credit instruments that were payable in Virginia, but ultimately payable in places like Philadelphia and New York. And those that originated maybe were drawn in New Orleans, but the money in turn came from New York and far off in London. So if we want to look at the, the Professor McGinnis talked about a chain, if we want to assemble a credit chain that ran through Richmond in New Orleans, we have to look uh, to the, the corner of Wall Street in, in New York and uh, to uh, Bishopsgate Street in London, uh, that in these centers where we don't associate them with slavery or the slave trade, uh, this is where a lot of the money originated that paid for those people in Virginia. You made a fascinating point about the, the rich and slave traders and their wealth. Uh, Maria, I noticed in your book you had some photographs of some of the homes of the slave traders, they lived extremely well. They did. They lived extremely well. And it's, it's um, been a little tough to track down as much as I was hoping to be able to track down about the wealth of the tra and the homes of the traders and the material comfort that they were able to live in because of their selling human beings every day, just in large part because so much of Richmond didn't survive to be photographed into the period of photography. But Hector Davis's home um, is, is shown in my book. And it's an extraordinary mansion, you would call it, um, that was actually only a couple of blocks from here. It was very close to the Library of Virginia. Um, I also, in the book, um, talk about Isaac Franklin's 
plantation. When he retires from being a slave trader, he takes his wealth and buys a large plantation in, the, in Middle Tennessee, as well as multiple plantations in Louisiana. And the money from that enslaved labor, as well as his slave trading, continues to support his lifestyle at his plantation in Middle Tennessee. Um, and Virginia, those of you who might in the audience be Cavalier fans, go who's. Um, <laughs> very interesting point. We played uh, and defeated in the NCAA tournament <laughs> yesterday, a school called Belmont. Well, Belmont is in Middle Tennessee at the place of Belmont Plantation, which was built by the widow of Franklin. Um, she fought his will. He had actually wanted to have a will to set up public schools to educate white children. Um, she broke that will, kept all the money for herself, built this extraordinary, I mean, it's really one of the most spectacular homes built in Middle Tennessee in the 1850s. Um, and that house still survives. And so if you go to Nashville, please make your way out to Belmont. It's, it's really an extraordinary place and a place where you can see the extraordinary contrast between the wealth that could be aggregated through a business of trafficking in humans um, and the lives that the enslaved had to live. You mentioned uh, the, the properties that uh, the slave traders acquired, uh, Franklin, Louisiana. One of those plantations, Angola, mm -hmm. is now the site of the Louisiana State Penitentiary, right. one of the more uh, centers of incarceration. So you, if, if you want to think about property having a, a sort of a, a dire um, element attached to it, that would be one. Um, I was impressed, and Greg Kimball, who introduced us, has a superb book, by the way, on antebellum Richmond. Uh, and one of the points he makes in the book is that these slave traders were men not only of, of wealth, they were men of political standing in the community. They served for years. On the, on the city council. And, and these slave traders were anything but pariahs. Uh, they were men of wealth, they were men of stature, and, and I think the fact that they got elected to important positions in city government year after year uh, explodes a lot of that myth about these men being a sort of uh, pariah class who, who nobody would have anything to do with because nobody in, in the South really approved of the slave trade. Uh, that's just nonsense. Um, it's a huge driver uh, for, for the Southern economy. We're, we're gonna know more about that, certainly when, when uh, we get a chance to read Calvin's book. Um, Alex, I'm intrigued by the fact that these men, uh, like Silas Amahandro and, and Hector Davis, took African-American women uh, as their life partners. Um, you're gonna tell us that story. I think a lot of us are anxious to, to sort of get the, the sense of, of how that how that could happen, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about what you're doing and what you're you're going to be telling us. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so, sorry, let me make sure my mic's working. Um, so I'm looking. Sorry. Um, so I'm looking at. A, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm looking at um, several Richmond slave traders, and this isn't just happening in Richmond. It's also happening in New Orleans, um, in South Carolina basically throughout the South, uh, slave traders who would take enslaved women um, as their mistresses or concubines. Um, so in Richmond alone, we have examples of Silas Omohundro, a very successful slave trader. Um, you know, he has a home in Richmond, a jail in Richmond. He owns property in, uh, in Henrico County. He owns property in Pennsylvania, where he sends his children to be educated. And he lives with an enslaved woman uh, named Corinna Hinton and uh, Hector Davis who we, we've talked about was a very influential trader. He lives with an enslaved woman whose name is Ann Davis, who he sends uh, to live in Philadelphia before the start of the Civil War with their children. Um, the man who jailed uh, Solomon Northup in Richmond has an enslaved mistress named Betsy Barber, who he sends to uh, live in Detroit. So I think, you know, and these are just a few examples, but I think what this speaks is, um, A, the highly sexualized nature of the trade. Um, so traders, Besides the kind of most explicit fancy trade, um, which is a very explicit way of dealing in enslaved women's sexuality, I think you know the very nature of the trade is that slave traders are interested in women's uh, capacity to reproduce. So purchasers are interested in purchasing um, 
what they call, quote, you know, breeding women so that they can kind of increase their capital and increase profit through purchasing women who can have children. So, um, you know, if women, uh, if a slave trader, for instance, sells someone a woman who he has um, labeled as sound, um, and she later turns out, you know, to have some kind of disease um, of the reproductive system or a problem with um, childbearing, then the owner can kind of return her basically to the slave trader and say, no, there's, she's defective. Um, there's something wrong with her reproductive system. So I think that these enslaved mistresses speak to kind of the sexual and reproductive nature of the trade and also um, to the domestic labor that goes into, into the slave trade, which we can talk about later. Yeah. Um, my college has a rare book library, Chapin Library. Not too many years ago, we acquired a uh, price list that was issued by uh, Betts and Gregory, which was one of the Richmond slave trading firms. And when the curator told me to come over and see something he had bought, I, I went over there. Uh, you saw a version of this uh, earlier uh, up on the screen. Uh, there's one out in the exhibit that's incompletely filled out. Uh, this was a completely filled out one that dated from August of 1860. One of the categories listed at the bottom was good young woman and first child. And that was a staple in the slave trade. And they were, they were priced separately and listed that way. And the, the reason for that, I think everybody in the room can probably guess. Uh, she had demonstrated her job, childbearing ability. And there, therefore, that made her uh, more valuable because the purchaser could anticipate additional wealth coming from her uh, as she bore additional children. Uh, none of those children would be free, of course, because under Southern law, the child took the condition of the mother. So every child born to a slave woman became a slave at birth, was essentially uh, commodified. Um, Phil, I know you've been looking at what's been going on in New York City, and I was intrigued when I saw that you had been uh, that, that you were following the interviews that anti-slavery activists in New York uh, were conducting. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what they learned and, and how you can use that. Yeah, I think I think that that perspective actually is, for me anyway, it's a nice way to frame what's happening here um, at places like uh, the Library of Virginia and the and the Historic New Orleans Collection. I think that what what this seminar is doing and what these institutions are doing in these exhibits is really recognizing and amplifying and elaborating on stories that African Americans already knew all along. Like this is not news, right? This is these are not only stories and narratives about the experience of slavery that are now getting brought out in these institutional settings in ways they weren't before. But they're also, I think, the perspective on slavery and the evaluation of what slavery was. Uh, Calvin last night was, was doing an, an incredible job, I think, of, of uh, I guess, entangling for us the, the legal domestic slave trade, uh, the buying and selling of slaves within the U.S., with kidnapping and sales into that market in such a way that it's all the, he was showing us it's all the same players. Um, the kidnap, the illegal slave trade within the U.S. is part of the legal slave trade in the U.S. And what Calvin was then doing was putting the label trafficking on all of this. I thought that was brilliant, right? But, but what that was doing was merely recognizing what African Americans have always known about the slave trade, that they've always talked about it in terms of theft, in terms of taking, Legal or not legal, it doesn't matter. When you're taken away from your family in Virginia to New Orleans, that's theft. That's theft of your body, that's theft of your person, that's theft of your family. It's theft. And so I think that, I think it's important that we recognize that what these institutions are doing is, um, is, is really I guess it's expanding the knowledge for everyone. It's bringing that story to everyone in a way that it, that it wasn't before. And this, this is a long conversation that goes back to the, the northern, uh, northern white abolitionists who had not experienced slavery, who for usually Christian reasons believed it was wrong, but didn't have a strong sense themselves about 
how, how wrong, right? Um, and reading the, the early abolition papers in the 1830s, Garrison's paper and then the uh, Liberator, uh, which started in 1831, and then the Emancipator, which is a paper started in New York by the American Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, there's a guy named Eliza Wright who was the editor of several of their publications. He's a totally unknown abolitionist today, but he was out there, he was going into the jails, interviewing people, writing up their stories and publishing those. And these are people who in New York City were, uh, some of whom were fugitives, who had been captured and he was getting their stories from the South. A lot of them were not fugitives. They were free people of color in New York City who were being kidnapped through a system of uh, collusion and uh, payoffs with justices of the peace. Um, and, this, and this too is part of the slave market, right? You're, and this, is, for me, is going back to this question of what is the slave market? The slave market is slavery. They're identical, right? And I think that a long time, really until only couple, maybe 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, scholars really thought of the slave market as kind of a sideshow. Like it was this thing that kind of happened down in Chaco Bottom, you know? It was this, it was this, this was part of slavery, but it wasn't really central to slavery. But if you read the narratives, the autobiographies of people, um, years ago I read all the, all the autobiographies I could find from people born in Virginia. Um, it's about, there's about two dozen of them, most of whom you've never heard of, right? It's not the Frederick Douglasses and the Harry, Harriet Jacobs. There's a lot of these narratives that are out there to be read. And they're very idiosyncratic. They're not abolition boilerplate standard propaganda. They're telling their stories. And what they tell is a story of movement and migration and being sold and moved from one person to another to another. They, they're, they're maps. And, and I think that, that like, that's the perspective that scholars now and institutions now are trying to, to bring to this for, for the rest of us, right? And to put that in back into the national, to the national story. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. It, it made me think when you were telling that story of, of a wonderful collection of, of Virginia slave narratives from the WPA 1930s, Weevils in the Wheat, it's published by University of Virginia Press. Um, the Virginia uh, interviews, this, this may be something some of you know about, the, the WPA during the Depression uh, sent historians out to interview um, former slaves who were still alive. A lot of interviewing was done across the spectrum, but this, this one group of interviews with slaves is fascinating. Most of the interviewers who were sent out in most states were Caucasian, they were white. In Virginia, they were from Hampton Institute and they were African-American. You can imagine the difference between a, a white interviewer coming into an African-American home in the 30s and saying, tell me about slavery, and, and a Hampton uh, person coming into the home and asking the same question. These are remarkable, frank, candid descriptions of individuals who were children at the end of the slave period, but who were still alive in the 30s. Uh, I've taught that book for, for a number of years, and my students pick the two main themes out automatically. The two things that get repeated over and over and over again. The sexual exploitation of slave women by masters and their sons, and the slave trade, and the loss of family members into the trade. It, it's seared into the minds of these, these individuals um, in ways that are, that are really... Uh, tragic and, and, and sad and, and almost hard to imagine uh, from our perspective. So, so you see this, you see this trafficking. I thought right. that was a wonderful word you used uh, yesterday, Calvin. You see this trafficking and, and it just ripples out uh, in, in ways that, that uh, are, are just appalling. Yeah, then to pick up on that, you know, there's a bill before the United States Senate to combat sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. And if we look at some of the cases of sex trafficking in the so-called domestic slave trade, uh, they look remarkably similar practices today. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking in particular of a woman, or a woman named Martha Swearet from Charlottesville, Virginia, purchased in 1831 in the, the, the uh, fall of January of 1832. Um, and by an agent of this 
people in an arm field. She was 16 years old. Uh, she, was, she had light skin. She was taken from Charlottesville, marched to Richmond, and incarcerated in a jail that I think sits on the site of the Circle K out on 17th and Broad today. Uh, this was Rice C. Ballard's a jail that adjoined the Seabrook Tobacco Warehouse, which has disappeared. So she was incarcerated there, initially with very few other uh, you know, inmates in this jail. When Ballard gathered enough to fill a, a ship's hold, he put them on a steam steamboat, uh, probably down uh, on the city dock. They steamed to Norfolk, put aboard a ship called the Tribune. The ship had sailed from Alexandria, Virginia. It was packed already, over capacity. Uh, by the time she was put on it, there were 222 captives on this Tribune, a company ship, and each uh, captive was allotted the space of the size of a tight coffin below decks. They, had, they were allowed a, on deck in, in the daytime, taken to New Orleans, uh, transferred to another agent of the firm, steamed up to Natchez and offered for sale as a fancy girl, a fancy maid. Now, she didn't sell, and she, so she was actually shipped back to Virginia. We have evidence that she was held for another, uh, another year, and by this time, the agents of the firm, the managers of the firm, had re were referring to her as the, uh, the Charlottesville maid. And they were asking for her to be returned. And in a credit crunch in the winter of 1834, the, the, the managing partner, Isaac Franklin, actually demanded she be returned to him. And uh, he made uh, in claims in no uncertain terms that uh, he had sexually abused her, raped her. And then he steamed her up to his nephew in Natchez, who is the sales director of the Natchez department of this firm. And he, in some very explicit uh, correspondence that survived uh, indicated that he'd done the same. And they also sent uh, invoices for her. So here's a woman who's trafficked in uh, a similar manner to the way that sex traffickers operate today, enforcing dependence, treating her as a commodity, and then enforcing that role on her so that in the background of this aggressive sexual banter that survives in this correspondence that's at the Southern Historical Collection at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and the Rice Carter Ballard papers, uh, she's actually saying, I, I want to go back to Virginia. And Rice Ballard, her owner in Richmond, uh, ex uh, we think maybe got her back or accepted her back because there's no evidence that she was actually sold. Mm -hmm. So here's a woman that had, uh, and she was 18 by that time, had undergone at least four passages between uh, Richmond and New Orleans had been passed around by agents of the firm who were acting as pimps for one another and who was being commoditized in a way that had little to do, arguably, with her ability to reproduce, but had everything to do with the connection between sexual aggression and the business of slavery. And I think going off that, I think that story really exemplifies, as you're saying, how traders knew what they were doing, that they knew that you know, sexualizing these enslaved women was a way to make a profit. Um, so in one instance, you know, two slave traders from North Carolina are writing to one another, and there are these two fancy girls um, named Mariah and Sarah, and they say, oh, I wish that all of our enslaved women were Mariahs, because they know that fancy girls will bring a higher, high profit, in many cases higher than what would be paid for um, you know, a young male field hand. So it's something that they're very aware of, and they're very aware of its marketability as well. Sure. Um, Silas Omohundro, um Slave Ledger sales book uh, is the University of Virginia uh, collection. I, I flipped through it. I recall um, a girl identified in the sales record as Sally Fancy, and among the things purchased for her were earrings. And you mentioned earlier today that, that there were merchants and... and uh, clothing and jewelry and people down in that area who just profited on the, on the way in which slaves were marketed and sold. Uh, what's, what's stunning is the, uh, the, the amount of money that was involved in this enterprise in the uh, late antebellum period. Uh, it's, it's, it's staggering. I imagine you've, you've reached some pretty impressive conclusions about that, Cal. Yes, if, if we... If we look at the, uh, this is going off of Edward, Ed Baptist's work, if we look at the, uh, the aggregate value of enslaved property in 1830, uh, it amounts to uh, the equivalent today, and, and I, I used a, 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 a 
currency calculator, it has the economic power value today of 56% of 2013 GDP. Now that's, a, that's economist talk for that's a, a whole lot of money, right? <laughs> and, uh, this, the, and, and you can measure the, the, the relative worth in different ways. If we just do dollar values, it's yeah. dollar for dollar commodity values, it's different. But the economic power value, yeah. Um, to say it's 56% of your, you know, the, this country's GDP in 2013 illustrates that it's, in, in, uh, I guess it's, it's been often said that as a species of property, enslaved people were second only to the land itself mm -hmm. in, yeah. in, uh, in economic value. Yeah, the value of slave property was in excess of all of the value of yeah. banks, railroads, industry put together. This is 1860. Uh, the only thing that was valued at a higher level was land itself. Um, so that, that again gives you a sense of the, the significance of it. Um, the Hector Davis uh, slave account books in Chicago uh, tell quite a story. Um, I don't know how the rest of you feel. I, I, I started looking for the, the record of Richmond slave traders out of a sort of odd idea of mine. I, I grew up in the Jim Crow South, and that meant 1940s and 50s as a young Caucasian growing up in, in that culture. Um, I, I was essentially looking what I now recognize as evil in the face and not seeing it, which is racial, racial segregation. And I got to thinking about my, my ancestors in the antebellum South who were part of the slave system. I one Thomas Roderick Dew who defended the system. And I wondered how they could look the evil of slavery in the face every day and not see it. It was segregation in my day, it was slavery in theirs. And I thought the ultimate evil was the slave trade. So I was going to try to read the, the letters of Richmond slave traders to get some sense of how they could do what they did. Um, and the Hector Davis account books were, were a revelation um, in Chicago. There's one page in that book that lists, I think it's something like 94 men and women who were shipped to New Orleans in one parcel. Every one of those men and women is an adult, only identified by first name. There is not a single child on that page. So every one of those adult men and women were shipped singly with no family, and the destruction that took place in the course of that one transaction is almost unfathomable. Um, I think part of the explanation is this enormous money that was made. Uh, greed is a powerful driver uh, in, in human affairs, and, and it's, it's certainly at work in this circumstance. Um, I, I was able to trace Hector Davis's slave sales over a period of several years. I, I learned a little bit about double entry uh, 19th century accounting doing the Tredegar records, which was a bit of a challenge for me. But I did discover that you could track those, those uh, weekly sales figures, and I, and I did that. Um, in one year, 1859, Hector Davis did over $2 million in slave sales. This is 1859. Uh, to get that into contemporary purchasing power, you would multiply that figure by a factor of 29. There's a wonderful website done by some economists at Chicago called Measuring Worth. Yes, this is it. And, and they, they, they track what, what a dollar is worth uh, today in what it was worth before. Right. I plugged in $1, 1860, up came 29. So if you multiply that 2 million plus, by 29, that's one dealer in Richmond in 1859. And he wasn't the biggest. That was probably Dickinson Hill. Do you think they were the, the largest? Um, and and it's, it's just uh, one, of those, one of those things that, that you can't fathom until you look at it and you say, good God, these are, these are uh, wealth generators of, of enormous capacity, these human beings who are being trafficked uh, back and forth. I often wonder where that money went. Um, I noticed in the exhibit out here, uh, the Traders Bank yeah. is mentioned. 
Um, that's Hector Davis. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right. And and um, I'm not I'm not an, an artistically uh, gifted, but you have piece of currency. Is that is that from your collection? It out there? is. Um, I, when I started doing research on slaves waiting for sale, um, I was curious the kinds of things that I might be able to find in the marketplace. And so one of the things I did was create an eBay search. Um, and I get an alert every day. And so I've now been doing this for five or six years. And when your search is slave, you do get some strange things because um, that covers many categories. Um, but you see an enormous number of historical objects. Um, and so when in a price range I can afford on a professor's salary um, and things that I thought were unusual or maybe important, it's not that I even imagined I was doing an exhibit at that point. But once I um, had conversations with Greg Kimball and Barbara Batson at the Library of Virginia and we decided in as early as 2011, um, they decided to support um, are doing this exhibition together, I began purchasing what I could. And one of the things I really wanted was a piece of Traders Bank currency signed by Hector Davis. So there's a lot of currency out there that's a restrike from the original plates, right? And, and this is the challenge in buying anything because there's a lot of fakes out there. Um, and there are some that have been <coughs> circulated with no signature. Um, but I was very excited to find one with his signature because I think there's in that one little piece of currency such a statement about the power of these slave traders, the economic power as well as the social capital that they were able to accrue in a city um, as slave traders. Um, and so that why we wanted to be sure to keep the Traders Bank as part of that story, because it really speaks very poignantly in this one little piece of currency um, to all that they had built up and how central the slave trade was to Richmond's economic prosperity. There's an image in the corner of the seated woman. Mm -hmm. she, she might be a light-skinned. Oh, that's, I hadn't thought about that. That's very interesting. Now I'm going to have to go back and look at it. Take, take um, a look. I'm yeah. wondering if it might be. That's, yeah, especially because of Ann Davis. Mm -hmm. That was what I thought it was. Well. Did you? Yeah. 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 So currency throughout the South in the period of the Civil War, um, you know, banks everywhere are issuing new currency, right? Mm -hmm. And there are dozens of these things out there, and they're fascinating. It is fascinating to see how the American South, now that pro-slavery has took all these states into seceding from the U.S. and establishing their new nation. How are they going to present themselves? And they are presenting themselves in many instances through the lens of slavery. This currency very often has enslaved people in the fields picking cotton. It has overseers on horseback. It has many depictions that are defining the Confederate States of America as a slave nation. Um, and so it's really important to pay attention to the way in which the Confederate States of America presents who they are, and they are a slave nation. Good point, good point. Um, one of your uh, colleagues at uh, University of Virginia in the history department has, has written a book called The Confederate War. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and he makes the point that had the South won the Civil War, something that I, as a boy growing up in the South, wished desperately had happened, um, the result would have been the creation of a slave-based republic. The, the creation and continuation of a slave-based republic. And I think we Southerners need to think about that when we hang the, uh, the Confederate battle flag. Up. And we have to think of, of the fact that the heritage of that, from an African-American perspective, is just that. Uh, a country based on slavery that would have perpetuated that institution. I happen to think for decades. Uh, no one knows, but uh, thank God. But, but the, the attachment of the South to the institution of slavery, uh, the white South, was profound. 
um, not only as an economic and labor system, but as a means of social control, because Southerners were, were constantly worried uh, that the slaves would, would, would rise, that, that they would uh, be corrupted by abolitionists, that, that their, their happy-go-lucky nature uh, would be turned by, by these voices uh, telling them that they should be free. Um, so slavery served multiple purposes for the South. It, it, we, we've stressed the economic, um, but, but certainly that whole social control mechanism is a very, very powerful one. Uh, when these, these panics over slave insurrection uh, occurred in the South, they resulted in, in wanton violence uh, with confessions extracted from supposed plotters. Yeah. Things of that sort. Yeah, I would add too that uh, those who had financial interests in New York and London also got jittery. Uh, there is uh, one of the the one of slavery's uh, biggest bankers, and uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of the New Orleans uh, panelists. Edmund Jean Forstall wrote in 1832, I believe, uh, reassuring British investors in st Southern state securities that they had more to fear, that the Londoners and the Parisians had more to fear from their rabble than we do from our enslaved, well, he didn't use the term enslaved people, mm -hmm. but that was the thrust of his argument. Mm -hmm. And when William Seward, governor of New York, I guess he was a senator from New York at that time, proposed uh, banning the interstate slave trade in 1858, he got uh, cr hackles and cries and, and outrage from Wall Street because so many of them were dealing in southern securities, they were uh, shipping cotton, they were the, the main financial backers of the southern states, and it's no accident that in 1861, as the uh, deep south states are seceding, there was a, 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 an uprising in New York City, a political uprising, where the Democratic Party proposed seceding twice, that is, New York City would secede from the Union and also secede from the rest of New York State because they were so heavily invested in the, the cotton trade. And uh, this, you know, this shows how it's, uh, it, it wasn't just a southern phenomenon, mm -hmm. but those credit chains uh, connected many, many people in the, in the north especially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Phil, I know you've done some work on the Creole. Uh, and this is an area in which you, you have, I think that would be of interest to people. Yeah, I, I remember, so, when the movie Amistad came out, maybe that's the way to talk about it, is sort of how we're, how we're thinking about, and, and in the light of 12 Years a Slave, how, we're, how we in the American sort of, in American popular culture are allowed to think about slavery or how we're channeled to think about slavery by people who make decisions in Hollywood. I, maybe the way to frame that, but I remember going to, Amist, going to see Amistad and, and at, the, at the time, uh, Talking with some other people at the, I was at the Woodson Institute at uh, at UVA at the time, doing uh, a, a fellowship there, working on my dissertation, and there were a couple of other people there who knew the story of the Creole as well, and we're wondering why doesn't that movie get made? So you know the Amistad story. These are some Mende Africans who are in being sold in by Cubans, I think, and uh, and and rise up and uh, are are basically. Uh, can't read the compass and, the, and they don't know the landscape, right? And so the shippers ship them up into the United States where then trials ensue and eventually they go free. While they were touring to raise money to fund their travel home, um, a ship leaves Richmond uh, with some hundred or so people on it. It uh, anchors in Hampton Roads outside Norfolk and takes on a few more people and they get out into open water, and 19 of the men rise up and take over the ship. They kill one person and, and, cap and take captive everyone else on the ship. And they, don't, they have skills and knowledge that allows them not to get caught in the ruse that the, that the Mende Africans did in the, in the, on the Amistad. They, um, they first discuss where they're going to go. And one of the, the most famous of these, of these guys is Madison Washington, because his name was Madison Washington, right? That was his name. <laughs> Madison Washington was from Virginia, 
Um, he had escaped in some way. We don't know much about his life before the Creole, but we know more about him than anybody else because he escaped and he got to Canada. And he was in Canada, and he was in contact with white abolitionists in Canada, uh, and he told them he was going back to go get his wife. And they told him he shouldn't go, but they help him go back. They, he does the, the reverse Underground Railroad, basically. He sneaks back in uh, to, to Virginia, and then he is uh, recaptured. We don't know what happens to his wife, um, and he's, he's uh, held by Lumpkin, along with most, uh, a number of the others, and uh, put on this ship. So he has some knowledge of the, of the broader world, uh, the broader Atlantic world, and he wants to go to Liberia. We're going to take this ship to Liberia. Liberia was a colony established by colonizationists, which was, that's a long story, but this was the initial white version of anti-slavery, which starts after the revolution and the idea is a coalition of northerners who are anti-slavery and planters who are, believe it or not, ideologically anti-slavery in some ways um, for complicated reasons. But this is a collusion and they, their idea is we will slowly abolish slavery, we will compensate the masters for the property and we will colonize all the free blacks, we will educate them, make sure they're Christian and then send them to a colony back in Africa, right? These are second, third, fourth generation African-Americans, right? Um, African-Americans vocally oppose this in protests in Philadelphia and New York and other places uh, where, this is, where this, these ideas are floating around. And eventually, um, Garrison and others pick up on this, and that helps fuel the true anti-slavery movement, which gets named abolition. That's, that's one of the distinctions there. So this is Liberia, the colony founded for this purpose, right? Um, it's not the most abolitionist thing to want to do to go to Liberia. Liberia was having its own problems. It was very, there were a lot of difficulties there. Um, the other people on the ship, there's uh, one named Ruffin. There's one named Blackstone. Uh, these guys don't want to go to Liberia. They want to go to Nassau, Bahamas, where they know that the British have enacted emancipation. Um, and it's actually after 1838, so it's actually true. Well, there's, there's, there's a labor system still in place that is... Um, much like in the American South. It's, it's not true freedom in, in the sense everybody's not free to go everywhere they want, do what they want, but it's not slavery anymore. And that's where they want to go, so they go. And uh, they're, they're able to, uh, two of them can read a compass and they teach others. So they have the white uh, ship, uh, the sailors who are, are going to still sail the ship, they don't know how to sail the ship. But one of them also says he's been to New Orleans before, actually, on the coastwise trade. And he says, uh, basically, I'll, I'll know if they're taking us to New Orleans. So he has that kind of coastal knowledge. Um, they have knowledge of the compass, and they watch the compass. And, uh, and then the other side of it is, is interesting, too. So basically, I was, I, I was interested in the Creole in terms of what I call geopolitical literacy, that these people on the Creole their freedom, they did it, they were successful because they knew how to read, well first of all they had to know how to read each other. They had to know who do you trust, who's got knowledge that's good knowledge, and whose knowledge do we trust. They had to have navigation to a certain extent, at least reading the compass, to know where they headed south to the Bahamas or they headed north back to Richmond. Or um, When they get to the Bahamas, there's another fascinating story that happens there. Uh, that also has to do with knowledge transmission. Really, for me, the idea uh, was opening up what we think of as kind of the bounded South to the South Atlantic and to the entire Caribbean. That this is part of a slave system that is that is imbricated in the British slave system. And as you were talking last night, you have British officers getting on board American slave ships, checking the roster and saying, "Oh, domestic slave trade checks out." Be on your way, mm -hmm. even while they have abolished the African slave trade, as have the Americans, and slavery by this point. Mm -hmm. So there's these systems that are interlocking and intertwined. So they, they, they get, they get, they're coming into the, to the port in Nassau, and the coast, the, the coast pilot comes out to guide them in, right, through the channel. And one of, the, uh, one of the sailors on the coast pilot says, basically, welcome, I'm from Charleston. 
I came here the same way you're just coming here. Right, so he was on one of these prior ships that was salvaged by wreckers, and was was freed in the Bahamas. And so he comes in, he got they guide the ship in. News travels fast, and basically a mosquito fleet, sort of a fishermen, black Bahamians surround the ship, and the British come on board with uh, Royal African troops, who are Africans who were rescued out of the slave trade, and for various reasons were impressed back into the British Navy, which is <laughs> <laughs> pretty close to slavery. <laughs> wow. But you have this like incredible African diasporic British American conflagration of, of culture happening right there in the harbor mm -hmm. of, of Nassau. And it's, uh, it's sort of a fascinating moment. The, the, the traders are allowed off the ship and they go on board. The, the 19 are initially arrested. And eventually, I think all were released, weren't they? Um, and then the, uh, the, um, the traders go on on, uh, on shore, and they're working with the American consul there to try to retake the ship. They go on shore looking for guns, and they go in these shops, and there are firearms for sale, but not to them. And they can't, they can't buy any guns in the port of Nassau. <laughs> so they go, they go back, and the, count, the consul's got some guns, and they, they there's, a, there's a sort of weak attempt made. But I th the point here is, I think, connecting, thinking about slavery as mobile. And that the entire system is about mobility. And that that mobility from the slave's perspective is, is, is devastating. Um, and it meant that you had to try to, to try to work your way through the system. You had to understand mobility and try to exploit it if you could. Through knowledge, through transmission of ideas, mm -hmm. through, um, through, through trying to reconnect. I'm interested actually in what happens on the southern end. I'm really looking forward to this afternoon and thinking about how do people rebuild networks? Mm -hmm. How do people rebuild culture? How do people rebuild families on, on the south end of it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something to look forward to this afternoon, uh, very definitely. Uh, Greg's just given me a, symbol that, a signal that we've got about five more minutes uh, of talk here, and then we want to throw things open for questions from this room and, and around the world. I guess we're getting internet, Twitter. Uh, feeds from from all over and the Twitter account explode we were told which is encouraging um, maybe a place to sort of wrap up our thoughts would be uh, something that emerged from a conference call we had before we we uh, put this program together um, I'm not sure who it was because we weren't skyping we were just just listening but 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 someone on the conference call said every slave alive was always in the market. Every slave alive was always in the market because there was always the potential for sale. Um, the phrase that masters used uh, when they wanted to threaten the slave with sale was, I'll put you in my pocket. I'll turn you into money and I can put that into my pocket. So I, I think that's really the reality of, of what we're talking about here when we're talking about the slave trade. We're talking about something that was omnipresent uh, in black life in this country. And, and even if you were free, you were not safe uh, because of kidnappers and the amount of money that, that could be made by that. Um, so if, if anybody wants to pick up on that, go ahead. If not, we'll, we'll let the questions come. All right, well, we'll take our first question from the Twitterverse. And this one comes to us without a name attached, but were slaves the biggest financial export commodity in antebellum Virginia? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So what we're, what we're, when we say yes to that question, what we're saying is as a category. So we're looking at flour, we're, we're looking at iron, we're looking at other things that Virginians exported. It's hard to quantify the trade because the... Uh, the, the state didn't keep the, the, the records that we'd like to have. But this is, uh, this is certainly, um, this would certainly be true over the period, say, 1830 to 1860. Yeah. Our next question comes from Steve Sweet in New Orleans. He asks, can you talk about what the value of an enslaved person might be in current U.S. dollars? I've actually done that. Um, I took that Betts and Gregory um, 
price list that, that my college owns and uh, computed the, the value of the various and sundry categories. Uh, you probably don't remember it from being on the screen when Maury did her, her wonderful talk. It's out there in the exhibit for those of you in the room. Um, the top category for men was uh, extra, extra man. Uh, the top price for an extra man was $1,625. If you multiply that by 29, you get something in the range of $47,000, which would be contemporary purchasing power. Um, I have a Xerox of that document from my library, and I copy it and pass it out at the beginning of my classes in, in History of the Old South. Mm -hmm and my class on, on the Civil War and Reconstruction. And I don't say anything. I just say, T take a look at this and, and, and see what, what this says to you. Um, their first reaction is disbelief. They can't believe that people are commodified like this. Mm -hmm. Then they see that it goes from extra man to second rate or ordinary, extra girl, second rate or ordinary. And then it lists children by sale beginning at four feet high. Children are sold by height. And they go from four feet by three inch margins to five feet. What that indicates is that children could be bought separately from their parents and were, more often than not, bought separately from their parents. Um, the, the, the smallest child, a four foot child, was bringing as much as $600 in 1860. So again, you multiply that by 29 and you get the figure. Um, it's, it's, it's quite appalling. I ran four foot height through the uh, manifests mm -hmm. of, the, of the coastal trade because that does give yeah. height. Uh, a four foot child frequently was as young as seven or eight years old yeah. in 1860. So you're buying seven and eight year old boys and girls uh, from the auction block in Chaco Bottom. It's so fascinating to me uh, the, the nuances of, of, of some of the research you all have done and some of the things you've shared. I remember when I first went to graduate school in Charlottesville many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, 35, um, it was a time when people, I believe it was a time when people were starting to become acquainted with Sally Hemings, for instance. And I remember visiting Monticello and I remember the, um, I remember the horror that the guides there had when a question would invariably come up about it. I also remember meeting or having okay, social occasions with older Charlottesville women who said, well, of course this happened. I mean, in the light of today, you, we think, well, yeah, of course these things happened. These um, liaisons happened. And so I guess my, my point is that as we continue to advance, we realize things that 20 years ago would have been a horror to think about. And so this is partly why this is so, this all is so exciting to me. Um, just to be brief, I wonder if anybody is doing any scholarship on what contemporary people remember, quote unquote, about the time of slavery. Um, I had coffee with a guy, just a guy, a, a guy in Richmond, and he says he remembers hearing the old people talk about you send the mother to the east and the father to the west and never the twain shall meet. And this was knowledge apparently that people had about families being sold off and separated. And so this is like in what year is this, 2015, I'm learning something that may have been a remnant of an old song, or maybe it's based in fact, I don't know. But my question is, have any of you uh, had any sense about, I mean, your scholarship is based on 
chancellor records and, and letters and things like that. But I wonder if you can talk, any, if any of you have any experience about uh, knowledge that is being gained from just regular contemporary people about this time. I've been lucky enough to um, meet the descendants of some of the um, slave traders and enslaved women uh, who I study. And so from them, I kind of get a sense of the family memory of um, their great grandparents or great grand, great great grandparents' relationships. Um, and in some cases, there is a knowledge of what that past was. And in some cases, there isn't. And it's something just in the past few years um, they've discovered. But that's something. I definitely like to pursue more to meet more descendants of the people I'm studying and kind of what the, the family history is there. I'd, I'd like to recognize two, two members of the audience uh, who are descendants of Solomon Northup. Um, I, mean, I guess maybe I'll ask you to recognize your uh, st <laughs> stand up and be heard. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> All right, our next question comes again from Twitter, and this is from Emily, who's asking, what happened to the children of the slave trader and his slave? That, that is a great question. Um, so it varies uh, according to family, but I would say for the Omohundros and for the Davises, they both sent their children to Philadelphia uh, or Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, and Calvin, you can speak to this too. Um, all of the uh, Omaha hundred children eventually were uh, listed as white by census takers um, and, you know, had very, some, where was an apothecary, um, a logger, they had mm -hmm. very successful careers um, and the Davis children as well um, were listed as white and, you know, attended school in the north um, and, you know, may or may not have remembered that legacy from their family. Yeah. I was, I, I could speak to that too. I did some research, we were talking about this yesterday in looking at the Omohundros and the Lumpkins too. Um, Robert Lumpkin had a, um, Mary Lumpkin was yeah. his wife, right? Yeah. She wound up owning the slave jail and sold it or gave it to yeah. Union Theological Seminary. Yeah. And that was the beginning of, of Union, right? Yeah. Um, on that site, in that jail. And there's, yeah. there's great stories about that. Mm -hmm. um, I was looking at Silas's record books. He has a domestic book too that keeps household expenses, and he records expenses for uh, for Karina and the kids, right? And he's giving Karina money to run the household. She's doing whatever sort of shopping needs to be done for the household, mm -hmm. uh, running the household. He's giving money to his sons and daughters. So there's a point where he buys his daughter a parasol, and he buys his son a pair of boots and a Panama hat. Right. So yeah. this is this is sort of the culture that those children are growing yeah. up in. Right. Um, and they're trying to trace their genealogy. At one point, I was while I was looking at Malvern and Mahindra wrote a massive genealogy of the family, and um, the will for Silas uh, liberates all of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the first thing a, a genealogist looks at? The will, the will, right? Right, sure. So clearly Malvern's read the will, and yet in his genealogy, the will is never mentioned. The children are listed, their birth dates are listed. Where do those come from? Those are not listed in the will. Exact birth dates. Those are coming from family Bible records and things like that. So Malvern Omohundro, this is in the 20s, 30s? When does he write the book? 30s? 30s. Yeah. 30s, 40s, so he's interviewing descendants he knows the story. Do they know the story? He's, inter he's talking to them and getting things like birth dates. How, what do they know at that point? These, are, these would be grandchildren, right? What he knows, do they talk about this? Does he? I, th I, that moment to me is a really interesting one. And, and he I, gives, oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know if you've. Well, he gives um, Corinna kind of a made up identity as well. He um, you know, changes her birth date, he gives her a different last name and parents who, well, I guess we don't actually know who her parents were, but chances are that it's not entirely accurate. That's so right. That he gave the name that does appear in the census as her parents, but you've determined that's not that's, her parents. That's not, yeah, right. not, her, not her real maiden name, so, yeah. Back to money. I'm interested in knowing um, what portion of the sale price would have gone to the slave trader. What, what portion of the sale price Oh, 
the trade or commission. Uh, so, I, so what's what's the markup? Uh, there's a case of a man named Sam Watts that was bought by this firm Franklin and Armfield in Virginia in 1831. Uh, they paid 400, $450, probably in Virginia banknotes, another $10 to the, the, the purchasing agent. Uh, we convert that into in $1830, $1830 to $2015, it's about $12,500. Sam Watts was put on a, a schooner, the, or a merchant ship, the industry out of Norfolk. Again, given as much space as would fit uh, a, a snug coffin, disembarked in New Orleans, uh, sold to slavery's banker Edmund Forstall for $950. So you've got a, a, a more, you know, 100% markup. So in that case, uh, there was uh, you know, that's quite a profit. So you can see the the profit motivation appearing. There's another side to it, and that is that uh, this firm acted like. Uh, a car dealership today, and that is they extended credit to customers at 10% interest. So we have to, to figure the, the, the markup versus the expected return and what the, what the risk, the credit risk was. And so a lot of times these uh, slave trading firms would inflate the price to cover the risk of not being paid back. And in fact, in, after this firm dissolved in the late 1830s, the, the principals spent most of their "Quote unquote retirement, chasing these bad debts." Um, but to, 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 to just answer your question, there was, uh, depending on the, the market, to use that awful economic term, there could be a hundred percent markup. Good morning. Thank you very much for this. All of this this morning. Uh, three th things that I heard this morning sort of came together in this recent discussion. Professor McInnes, you, you, you quoted, um, uh, it never entered their minds that such abominations would occur. And students confronted by, by uh, documents indicating the commodification of people had a hard time getting their heads around that. And finally, the, the observation somebody made that African Americans have been repeating these narratives for generations. And it seems, and I'd be curious about your reaction, it seems that for, the, for many of us, these narratives finally become legitimate when, once they're repeated by white people. And I, I'd like to hear something about that. <laughs> yes. I, I think that's a brilliant observation. I'm sorry, Annette, Annette Gordon-Reed isn't here to talk about the Hemings family because she took the Hemings family tradition seriously and began to check. And she discovered, uh, to my mind, irrefutable evidence that, that's been corroborated by DNA. Um, I taught at the University of Virginia way back when for a year as a visitor and used to have lunch with Duma Malone, the great Jefferson biographer, down at the corner university cafeteria. And I had the audacity, I was a young kid, I had the audacity to say, uh, Professor Malone, what about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings? And, and he, he looked at me like I was some sort of an insect, and, and he said, uh, there's nothing to that. Mr. Jefferson would never be involved in that sort of thing. I think that speaks to your point, uh, that, that, that whites simply have not wanted to come to grips with the evil that was slavery. And, and I suppose that's understandable, but I think it's unfortunate because we get these historical memories passed along that sort of sanitize the institution, rub, rub the edges off of it. It's, it's sort of an early yeah. social security system. Whites and blacks got along. Everybody was happy, took care of each other. Sure, they did some work, but they were well cared for, and they were treated like family. You don't have to get very, very far into the slave trade at all to see how, how ridiculous that is. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, sorry. I was... Uh... <laughs> For when I was working on my book, I wanted to see how the American school system had taught the American slave trade and called out of the deep bowels of the University of Virginia Library a number of editions of what was called the Cavalier Commonwealth, um, which was the textbook issued to school children. Um, and, you know, well into the 1960s, still saying exactly what you were saying. Treated like family, slave trade was rare, um, and on and on and on. Um, and it was a, a reminder to me from my own childhood and the stories that had been, I didn't grow up, but I grew up in the South, um, this complete 
washing and denial. And so mm -hmm. what I was talking about at, at the end, um, speaking very much to the fact that these stories have been there in the African in the African American community for generations. But it's important for right. the rest of us to be honest about those stories um, and to bring them out into the light. And so thank you for being here today and, and joining us in that conversation. Absolutely. We have another question from New Orleans, from Marilyn. She writes, it seems that in the Richmond case, the wealth generated from tra traffic in enslaved people has left a lasting imprint in the local economy. But does this hold true on a regional level in the Deep South? I heard another source talk about how Mississippi was the richest state in the country during the height of slavery, but now it is the poorest state in the country. Yeah, so this is, <laughs> well, there, it's, it's a great question. There's, uh, the answer is, is long and complicated. Um, one, of the, one of the things that, that struck me about Maury's talk this morning was that this, this moment of, of um, jubilee what did that mean economically when, when Lumpkin uh, unshackled 50 human beings that he intended to sell, uh, that uh, the, their, their market value disappeared? And so this is, this is what confronted slaveholders. This is, the, uh, this is the risk that the South, the, the Confederates, I should not say the South, because we usually just code that white, the Confederates took when they seceded. And this is what uh, Abraham Lincoln said in his second inaugural address, that uh, basically one side risked slavery and made war. Uh, the, other, the, the other side risked war. <laughs> um, so yes, when, uh, when, the, when emancipation happened, when jubilee happened, uh, the South lost the second largest species of property, to put it in those awful economic terms. And this is, this is one reason why the, uh, the, 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 the subsequent economic history of the South is how it is. The other reason which uh, has been getting some attention lately is cotton. Uh, and cotton being a cash crop that is a world commodity, uh, and the only thing that you could, uh, just about the only thing to, to uh, grow in the post-war South made it, uh, 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 gave it diminishing returns as an economic plan. The more cotton you grew uh, in the long run, the less uh, returns you could reap for it, and that's part of the reason. I would add, too, you have four million people who are who are who are not being compensated for any of their labor, right? And and aren't being given anything. So you have you have four million new consumers with no money, yeah. and and you have and you have uh, landowners, fifty percent of their capital. I mean, you do that. You do those two things simultaneously to any economy, and and right. yeah. And then there's a the long story that follows. Yeah, right? and not to mention the 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 devastation of the Civil War. Half the the white male population of military age is dead or disabled, and, and the rest, <laughs> right, uh, what are you going to do? How are you going to pick up from that? Our next question again comes from Twitter, and Martha asks, were slaves insured, and if so, how were policies structured? They were they insured. Were insured. Yeah. They were insured. There's an insurance policy in the exhibit here. Um, it was, it was not uncommon to insure slaves. They could not be insured for their full market value. Mm -hmm. uh, that might have been too tempting for a slave owner uh, to cash in, in 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 ways that we don't even want to think about. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the policies were, were, were common. Um, there were risks involved. Actuaries stay up nights figuring out risk. Mm -hmm. If you sent a slave from Virginia to the Gulf Coast, the premium went up dramatically. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you could insure a slave. It was done. It was often done for slaves who were in the slave market. Mm -hmm. I ran across one letter. It said, uh, James may not sell right away. Maybe you should insure his life and at the same time paddle him to make him look right on the auction block. Mm -hmm. So like, paddle and, and ensure. Right. I'd like to pick up on that because the great fear of sending an enslaved person to the marketplace was disease. Mm -hmm. um, you're congregating a lot of people together in an enclosed space. And if any is into that space, especially with smallpox, that's the thing they mm -hmm. feared most, yeah. then potentially everybody in that jail would catch smallpox and many would die. 
So that was often what they were insuring against. Um, and slave traders went to great lengths to try to ensure uh, the health of the people before they entered the market. Um, and you mentioned also the, uh, the physical abuse that was an integral part of the slave traders' arsenal of behavior. So when I was talking about the way in which people would perform in the marketplace, it was against the threat of being beaten if they did not do so. Um, and so they were expected to perform. It was often referred to as looking likely um, to speaking right. And there's tons of correspondence from owners to slave traders suggesting that people be beaten in order to get this proper behavior. And in the slave jail, they often used not a whip, that would lacerate the skin, but they developed a special kind of paddle. And there's one in the exhibit, which is a strap of leather with holes in it that would have the same physical pain resulting from being whipped by it, but did not lacerate the skin. Um, so traders began using that as a way of protecting their investments. And going back to what you were saying earlier about kind of industries related to the slave trade, um, doctors, you right. see tons of doctors yeah. Yeah. showing up in account books, some um, in the case of Richmond who have offices in the Exchange Hotel, which is conveniently right next to the slave market. Good point. The only thing I would add about the only reason we have so much information about the Creole revolt is uh, that the slaves were insured mm -hmm. and the insurance company refused to pay and the slave traders sued and it got decided one way and went to appeal and I now cannot remember the outcome of the case because mm. when I read it I was just interested in the testimonies mm. but they interviewed all the people on board and took took all the deposition they were they were there were, there were questions about whether the ship was overpacked whether it was shipworthy whether they had taken precautions mm. this sort of thing um, yeah. but yeah so sometimes those those the court cases that result from these is where we get some of the information that we have good point Hello, I've enjoyed this immensely. However, there's a library on the stage, and every time you uh, mention something, you talk about another book. Now, I don't know how many books I'm supposed to get. <laughs> but, but I'd like to know what compelled maybe one or two of you to even go in depth you've done with your writing books, etc., on slavery. I might start with that by by just financially, <laughs> I, I was at a uh, I was at a conference at Stratonia that Phil Schwartz from VCU organized on slavery. Uh, I just published Bond of Iron, which is a study of a slave community in the Valley of Virginia, iron workers, and he invited me to come down and talk about uh, in, uh, industrial slavery. Uh, I made a presentation to an audience like this and. Uh, asked for questions. First hand that went up was from an African-American teacher uh, who had come in, I think, from somewhere in the Midwest. And, and he looked me in the eye and he said, how did someone as white as you get interested in our history? And I was really rocked by that. Uh, I'm a white guy, no question. How did I get interested? And, and I realized, and I, I stammered and one foot the other, Mm -hmm. And I finally said, you know, I grew up in the Jim Crow South, and I, I didn't see what was right there in front of me. And I think my whole career as a historian has been driven by trying to understand how white Southerners could do what we did and not see what we were doing. And that was the first time I had put that in, into words, first time I had articulated that. And, and that's basically what I've written about in this manuscript that I've just, uh, just finished. Um, that's just one one person's experience, but, but that was mine. I'll add mine was similar. I, I am a bit younger, so I didn't grow up in a Jim Crow South, but I grew up in a recently desegregated South, but it was a South of denial. It was a South that only told one history. Mm -hmm. um, and as I came to understand uh, that history more fully, I thought it was very important that we tell the whole story um, that we tell American history, not just white American history.
Uh, I, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I don't. I, I grew up in a little town in East Tennessee, where there weren't any African Americans in the school system that we knew of. Right. Um, there had been African Americans in the town at some point. But and we only I mean, as a kid, I just kind of vaguely knew almost I mean, really almost nothing. about This, this is like a coal. This is a coal mining uh, timbering town. Um, I wound up doing uh, a paper in grad school on the town and on migration to the town for labor. And there was a point where this tiny little town, 20, it was mostly single men living in the downtown part of the town. 20 percent of them were black and the rest were Irish, uh, Italian. Um, Lithuanian. It was a pretty, pretty diverse group there. Today, you would never know that, that that this was the history of the town, right? This is a little hick white town, right? Um, the whole county has twenty five thousand people in it. Um, so I think for me, it was at some point I was already interested in that, but I think really out of ignorance. And we didn't grow up with there was no remnant of segregation because it was there weren't any black people. Right. There was it was just that that history was was not there for us to even know about. Mm -hmm. And um, so we didn't we didn't grow up with any of the it didn't feel like we were growing up with injustices because it was just not there. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think then going back and recovering that and seeing like how things, you know, why did these people all come and then why did they leave? And I think those kinds of stories became fascinating to me. And it, so, for, so really, for me, it's out of out of ignorance and trying to study how other people's lives have been and what and and how how things are now and how different they were at points of this. Yeah. Um, I'll, 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 I had a, a similar experience to, to Maury's growing up in a place with a slave past that nobody talked about. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll forego that those details in favor of uh, more questions from the audience. Hello. Um, I wanted to address the issue of slavery and um, the use of the terminology human trafficking um, from last night's lecture and into today's discussions. Um, according to the UN ILO's um, latest report of 2014, there are today approximately 23 million people living in modern day slavery around the world. That um, estimates a value of about $150 billion. Mm -hmm. This is a commercial industry that still exists, mm -hmm. very prevalent today. Um, in my travels to Richmond this week, uh, we were running, driving along the Interstate 95, and alongside the highway there is a billboard that um, states that trafficking exists in Virginia. This is um, a prevalent issue. It exists today. Um, and it's important that um, we all take um, action that we formed. And um, Mr. Sherberhorn mentioned, <coughs> excuse me, I'm nervous, <laughs> mentioned that um, we do have a bill before um, Congress, which is called the End Slavery Initiative Act of 2015. You can go to endslaverynow.org and read about that as well. Um, but it's important that we do address this issue of human trafficking today because we're, you know, 150 plus years out from the end of slavery and we're still living in a, a, uh, conditions in which we uh, do not value human life. And so my question is to all of you, how would each of you um, perceive, not perceive, but find the solution and resolving human trafficking as it exists today. Um, I know it's not an easy question to be answered. There is no one solution, um, but I'd, I'd be interested to hear from each of you what your thoughts are on uh, reasserting our human rights, um, because freedom, as we know, is not free. We have to reassert that continuously. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, as something that was mentioned earlier in the discussion panel, perhaps we could all perceive ourselves as living in the market. So uh, I'll speak as just briefly as a present day abolitionist, uh, speaking specifically as uh, to, to sex trafficking. Uh, we should go after the traffickers and not those people who are trafficked. And I think that the traditional law enforcement model has been to um, punish the uh, 
the sex worker, the prostitute, the trafficked, who are in most cases trafficked women, trafficked female subjects. And uh, this presents a huge obstacle. So that's one very um, easy to say <laughs> um, plan uh, is to say, let's go after traffickers, let's go after pimps, let's go after the Johns, you know, the people who are these, uh, you know, participating in this, make, generating the returns. Uh, the, other, uh, the other thing is to try to make it more visible and there are billboards around Phoenix, too. And Phoenix is a major hub of the, the uh, sex trafficking industry, or the human trafficking industry, uh, to tr try and um, lend subjects more visibility to look for them. One of the things I think is striking about the, uh, the United States domestic slave trade is the invisibility of some of these subjects. Uh, that, you know, how can Solomon Northup be, be kidnapped and trafficked out of uh, Washington, D.C. and Richmond? Uh, who was looking? Who was looking in the holds of ships? Yes, it was done under the veneer, veneer of a, a legitimate commerce, uh, but uh, I don't know how specifically to do that. But I think these are these are two things to keep in mind when we're addressing modern day trafficking. Uh, we're reaching a point where we're to wrap things up, and I know we still have some people who who have questions. How much time do we have, Greg? We're pretty much at our limit. We're we're at our we're at our <laughs> limit. Okay. Uh, can we take one or we're, sure, we'll take one. yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take one more. Send the others to New Orleans. <laughs> Hi, um, I had a question about the Treadgers Inn factory and um, the iron makers of the Confederacy, Confederacy, excuse me, um, in the sense that you guys mentioned that in our school system, we don't teach slavery in the same light in which it actually happened. And then we don't really teach urban slavery at all. So my question, um, Treadgers Inn, he, I forgot the name of the person who owned it, mentioned that he had several slaves that were enslaved there to help make iron and things like that. So if you could just touch base on urban slavery within Richmond, Virginia. Urban slavery, that's, that's probably mine. Uh, urban slavery was a major phenomenon in the, in the South. Uh, Richmond prospered enormously from uh, slave labor. All the tobacco factory hands pretty much were enslaved, many hired by the year. Uh, the Tredegar had replaced a lot of their skilled rolling mill hands with slaves. Uh, uh, the white workers went on strike. Joseph Reed Anderson, the proprietor, broke the strike. Um, at the start of the Civil War, about 60 slaves worked at Tredegar, something in the vicinity of 600 total workers. So they were about 10% concentrated in the rolling mills and were highly skilled, very skilled industrial workers. Uh, during the Civil War, that, that number expanded dramatically. Probably 50% of, of the Tredegar's labor force at the height of the Civil War uh, were enslaved, uh, both in Richmond and at blast furnaces out in, uh, in the western part of the state. So it, it's a major phenomenon. It was highly, highly profitable, and the level of skills that slaves acquired was impressive. Uh, there was no job, basically no job in the South that slaves could not and did not do. Uh, and industrial slavery is an important and I think understudied uh, topic. I would say urban slavery deserves more attention than it's gotten as well. It's a good question. Wonderful. Well, let's thank our panel, please. <laughs>